<laughs> Good morning, everyone. If I could ask you to bring your conversations to a close, there'll be lots of chance for networking later. Um, my name is uh, Adam Winter, and I'm the National Lead for Sexual Health, Reproductive Health, and HIV at Public Health England. Um, and on behalf of PHE and THT, I'd really like to warmly welcome um, everyone here today. Um, my team in, in, in PHE um, commissions the HIV Prevention England program that um, Terence Higgins Trust um, with local activation partners has been delivering for the last few years. Um, and I just wanted to say that PHE is, is, is really proud to support um, all the HIV prevention efforts of, of, of everyone in this room um, and to also really thank all of you who um, have uh, submitted abstracts and are um, contributing to the really fantastic and varied agenda um, we've, got for t we've got for today. So thank you all for that. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Ian Green, the Chief Exec of uh, THD. Thank you. To be held. Uh, if you don't have a copy, um, if you get a bag down in the reception area, um, that you will be able to access the full program there. Um, the, apparently, I've been told there's not going to be any fire alarms uh, uh, this morning or, or later in the day. Um, so if a fire alarm goes off, um, go to one of the exits, um, and uh, the toilets are marked uh, on the program. Um, I just want to thank my colleagues uh, who've uh, put the program together uh, for this conference, uh, and I hope that there'll be elements of it you'll find uh, interesting. Uh, I hope there'll be elements of it that you will uh, respond positively to. I also hope there'll be elements of it that will shock and surprise you. Uh, and I hope that you'll go away from today uh, having a better understanding uh, of uh, what we can all do um, to achieve zero new HIV transmissions uh, within England. Um, we have a 
this, this session uh, is a, a panel session where we have three presentations and the opportunity at the end for some questions. I'm delighted that Bruce Richmond's here from uh, the Prevention Access Campaign uh, in the US. Bruce is a good friend of ours uh, and is a regular visitor to the UK. Um, and uh, as you know, the Prevention Access Campaign is the pioneer of the U equals U movement. And I'm not going to say any more because I don't want to steal his thunder. So over to Bruce. Thank you, Ian, for that, um, that, that nice introduction. And it's really a wonderful opportunity to be here. So I appreciate it. Another chance to get the message out and to, to highlight the incredible work going around uh, the world, and especially here in England. I mean, it's, it's really, really rejuvenating for me to come here um, because it's like a dream for U equals U. It's actually a wet dream. It's that good. Um, so, so thank you for, for having me here. So today I'm going to talk about um, U equals U, the message, why it's so important, and a little bit about why we didn't know about it. And then I'm going to talk about the movement that got that message out from the realm of science to the public it was intended to benefit. But first I want to say privilege. I'm a man of substantial privilege. I'm cisgender, I'm white, I'm male, I have health insurance, I have stable housing, food security. This has enabled me to get to undetectable and stay undetectable. And we have to make sure that every, anyone living with HIV who desires to get to undetectable and benefit from U equals U has that opportunity. And I'll explain a little bit how we can do that. So what is U equals U? I think pe most people know it means that a person living with HIV who is on treatment and has an undetectable viral load cannot transmit HIV through sex. This is regardless of viral blips or STIs. And this is about sex. This isn't about breastfeeding or injection drug use. There isn't enough research in those areas, but hopefully there will be soon. So this is really a huge moment for people with HIV and the field. In 1996, we learned that treatment would keep us alive, and now we know that treatment also means we cannot transmit HIV to our sexual partners. Now, this is really, really revolutionary, because when you think about it, so many of us who live with HIV, like myself, since 2003, never imagined a time when we could love, we could have sex, or we could conceive children without fear. Fear of transmitting HIV had been present in the most intimate moments of our lives. U equals U sets us free. It changes everything for our social lives, our sexual lives, our reproductive lives, and it dismantles the HIV stigma that we have been living with and dying from for far too long. And it's aligned with our treatment goals because it reduces the anxiety associated with testing. And it's an added motivation to start treatment, stay on treatment, and stay engaged in care for our health and to prevent transmitting HIV. Now this one is incredibly important and pertinent right now and is a little bit hard for folks to understand. So when we would argue, like in the United States, 500 activists went to Capitol Hill recently, it's the largest activist con uh, conference in the country, and they argued to increase access and remove barriers to treatment and care and the services for the well-being of people with HIV, for our lives, for our health. Now what I learned in this field in my short time is that many people don't care about our lives and our health, but they do care about prevention and ending the epidemic. So now we have what we call the public health argument to address the third view, universal access. So now we can say we need treatment, care, and services, and removing those barriers so that we can get to undetectable, if we choose, for our own health and to prevent new transmissions which will get us closer to ending the epidemic. And we're seeing that public health argument used all over the world, except in the United States, where we continue to argue and shout that we don't have access to treatment, and U equals U won't help that, instead of actually using U equals U to remove those barriers. Does that make sense? 
It's really, really important that advocates understand this. I have like three slides typically on it to try to convince people to use it. Um, so why do we know about this campaign? Why did we, why did, about this uh, science, why, why did we need this campaign? So the studies that prove U equals U and the, the observational research goes all the way, it goes back 20 years. And those studies, especially the recent landmark studies, are promoted independently by the institutions that fund them. So you have all these different streams of information about studies, but there wasn't a conclusion of, about all those studies, except for the Swiss statement in 2008, which was widely criticized and, con and, and discredited. And there were a few smaller statements that didn't really go anywhere. So as a result, privileged folks like myself who have access to the best you know, medical care, uh, we're learning U equals U. I learned in 2012. And people that were marginalized by the system were being left out. And that's not right. We feel that everyone living with HIV has a right to accurate information about our social, sexual, and reproductive health. So we also talk about how HIV stigma is an emergency. And when I got into this, I would see leaders talk about how HIV stigma is the greatest barrier to ending the epidemic on one hand, and on the other hand, they'd be exaggerating the risk from people living with HIV. So we really, really need to get this message out and that's how we move forward, because science doesn't have a publicist, and so we became that publicist. And our motto was, tell the truth. Tell the truth, or we'll tell it for you. So here's what we did. We went straight to the scientists, the lead investigators of the studies, and we said, your science isn't getting out to the public it was intended to benefit, and that's not their jobs. Their job is to do the science, not to promote it, and certainly not to draw a conclusion on all the body of evidence. But they did something amazing. They worked with us on a consensus statement for six months to clear up mixed messages and to confirm that U equals U was true. And at the same time, we created an advocacy video of the voices of every key affected population uh, of people living with HIV to demand that the truth be told to everyone living with HIV. So our idea was to take that statement, the video and our voices, and go out and change the narrative about our bodies. So we would engage influential people and institutions to join us in what we knew was true. So we reached out to US activists who were going to Durban, the big conference in 2018, and we said, will you please print this out? My colleague and I said, this is gonna be really important. And they said, we're too busy, who are you? We're not gonna print, we don't have a printer. And we were really sad, we were really dejected, but because they said no, but something amazing happened. New York City said yes, just a few weeks later, and became the first city in the world, the first public health department and public health official to confirm that U equals U was true. And at that same time, concurrently, Terrence Higgins Trust released a very strong, strong statement, the first NGO and first medical director in the world to confirm that people on effective treatment cannot pass it on. So at the same time, we started their conversations with the US CDC, NIH, and other public health. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. Should I just do that whole part again from the beginning? <laughs> okay. No, I won't. Um, uh, so we, we, um, you know, so we got the, we, we, we were pushing the US government uh, to update their messaging. And that, those conversations were really intense and heated at times. Um, there was some yelling, me. There was some swearing, me, once, and I apologize. But ultimately, we really worked together to come to a place where the activists and the, and the, and the public health officials really changed the world together. So now I just want to focus on Terrence Higgins Trust for a minute. And if you can imagine, back in the summer of 2016, we just had this statement to go on. Um, but, oh, oh, God, I'm sorry. There, okay, oh, the video, okay. Hi, okay, so, um, but now we have this statement from Terence Higgins Trust, the second largest HIV AIDS charity in Europe to use. So we would use this statement in Michael Brady's face, and we would say to the government, look what they're doing in England. Look what they're doing in England. The United States is falling behind, so I, can't, I cannot stress enough how important it was to get this statement from, from, from England. And then, um, 
Okay. Oh, oh, that's great. Okay. How am I doing on, on time here? Um, okay. So, um, and then what happened was, I love this. I can go like this. <laughs> what happened was the, those, the, th this campaign just exploded on social media. All these infographics and memes started uh, 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 spreading around the world. On the top left is the Teenergizer program in the UK, in the Ukraine, H equals H. Uh, on the right is uh, uh, nurses in a government funded program in Kazakhstan going out in the freezing cold snow making H equals H. There's O equals O bus in Norway, U equals U van in Indonesia. So all over the world. And many of these movements were about celebration. So you can see a march in Kampala, Uganda on the right, taking the stage in Paris at IES 2017. And it, because of all of this incredible energy around the campaign and the combination of work between public health officials, scientists, and, and researchers, we now have 960 partners from 100 countries on every single continent. We have the leading institutions in the world are now saying U equals U, including uh, the World Health Organization's confirmed the science and CDC. And, and now I'm gonna just show you a little bit about what is going on around the world. Uh, sorry, this slide's a little bit formatted off with the transition to this computer, but um, uh, let's see. First is Terence Higgins Trust and in England. Um, okay, so that's animated. <laughs> it's fun in videos, but, uh, but, but England really is leading the world in this message, and it's, because, it's not because you have universal health care. It's because of the leadership here. All these organizations on the bottom have leaders who have committed to getting this message out, U equals U, and can't pass it on. It's extraordinary. I'm always racking my brain. It's, why are you doing so well here? And it's no wonder you reached and surpassed 90, 90, 90 because of the leadership. Vietnam has fascinating campaigns. Zambia has this really great uh, music video, a national campaign. Japan, this is a strip party in Osaka, Japan. The, you know, they're stripping. Um, uh, in Venezuela, where there's limited or no access to treatment, they have an M equals M campaign and an I equals I national campaign reaching indigenous population in the Delta District. And that's a, a, a campaign, the first campaign in the Middle East from Lebanon. So when we talk about risk, we need to remember, when you describe how, you know, the risk of transmission, we're talking about risk between one human being and another human being, and the most intimate moments of our lives. And the words that we use can either bring people together to have a freedom to love, to have sex, have babies, without fear, it's incredible, or destroy those relationships tear people apart. Because when you exaggerate the risk from a person living with HIV, you put our lives at risk. So the, the words we use are really important, and healthcare professionals are one of the biggest barriers, unfortunately, still in many parts of the world to getting this message out. And Viva has a really strong statement that we have on our website and on theirs, urging healthcare professionals to say U equals U and be clear. We really can say zero risk. We really can say that. What we're seeing now around the world is when patients are able to, they have the luxury to, they're firing their doctors because they're learning elsewhere about U equals U and it's breaking trust between patient and provider. So and finally, how do you become a part of this? Um, all staff need to be trained in organizations, including people at the front desk and U equals U. And, and to, put to put together opportunities like this to learn about the message, which is really important. Communicate this in a way that's clear. We can be clear, um, be confident, it's real. You don't have to say, well, you never know, it's real. Um, consistently, it has to keep going out repeatedly for people to understand this. Even people with HIV, like myself, had a hard time internalizing it. The more we hear it, the more we believe it's true and internalize it. And consciously, we must communicate that no one living with HIV is a danger, regardless of viral load. All of us have opportunities for healthy, hot sex. There's condoms and PrEP in some parts of the world. We cannot create a viral divide by shaming folks who don't have an undetectable viral load. We have to make U equals U a revolution that includes everyone and use the public health argument to help lift up everyone. Advocate with the public health argument, as I mentioned, it's so important, and connect to the social movement. This is how this has gone, you know, uh, 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 viral, viral oh, HIV. Now I'm just going to end with my friend Allison Roger, you and I have a cameo. <laughs> Hi, Allison. Um, this is uh, uh, today is marking a revolution in what it means to live with HIV. So, thank you so much for your research. Um, I have a question on behalf of the U equals U campaign. 
there are many providers that are still not accepting this message. They try to focus on the risk is not zero scientifically, or they focus on their patients aren't going to be adherent and they won't know that they're detectable, or they say there's a rise of STIs already, so they don't want to share this with their patients. We get every single uh, kind of excuse. What would you say to clinicians or any other information provider who is withholding this information from people with HIV? Yeah, um, and I, I just want to pay tribute to the U equals U campaign. It's been astonishing. Um, I, I think the time for excuses are over. I think it's very, very clear um, that the risk is zero. So I, I very much think we have to promote this. I think if you're on suppressive ART, you're sexually non-infectious, and yeah, the time for excuses is over. And I, Thank again, you. pay tribute to you and your work. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, Alison. So that phrase, the time for excuses is over, we've seen transferring people living with HIV to love and finally to live without fear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, and there'll be the opportunity, uh, hopefully at the end of this session, uh, to ask questions. We'll just uh, encourage colleagues uh, to, to come in and take a seat. Um, that as uh, many of you will know, that uh, there is currently an independent HIV commission uh, that was established by Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust uh, to focus on what we need to do in this country to get to zero new HIV transmissions. And I think all of us in this room know that this is absolutely doable. But what actually needs to happen in order to make that happen? Uh, and we were delighted uh, to, uh, uh, when Damien Gabeel uh, accepted the invitation to chair the Independent HIV Commission. And she's going to say a little bit about the work of the Commission uh, shortly. But before she does, I just want to play a very short video. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien Gabil. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and um, morning, everybody. Um, now, when I was first asked about taking on this role, I thought, gosh, do I really want to take on that challenge? Um, can we really achieve the goals that have been set out? Now, Having worked for 38 years in the insurance sector and never really been active working with HIV, although I've had friends who've died of AIDS and things over the years, I've never been actively involved in it. But I looked at those two things and I thought, why am I qualified to do this? And then I realized that actually, if we want to achieve the elimination of HIV transmission in 10 years' time, we're going to have to do things a little bit differently. And that is what I've been doing in the insurance world. And my very last role was running Lloyd's of London. I was there as the CEO for five years. Now, Lloyd's of London, very unique insurance market, that was actually formed in 1688, so a few hundred years ago. 
And when I was asked to take on the role as the CEO of Lloyd's, I was asked to modernize it, to bring it into the modern world, because after 325 years of existence, it was still doing things exactly the same way as it had done 325 years earlier. And I thought, how do we approach this challenge? What do we do? And I said, I'm going to take on that challenge. And what I realized was that we needed some different people around the table. We needed people who were slightly outside of the market, slightly outside of that sort of sphere of expertise to come in with some different views. And I realized that the power of diversity was going to be the answer to modernizing Lloyd's. So that's what we did, and that was what I led. And when I thought about taking on this role as the HIV Commission Chair, I said, you know, this is all about people. This is all about getting people together, diverse groups of people together. Because when that happens, when you get people who have different views and who have different ideas around a table, it's when the creativity and innovation so necessary to move things to a place that you previously thought wasn't possible, it's only when you get them all together that that comes about. So that was why I said, yes, I'm going to take on this role, and we are going to achieve what might seem to some people the unachievable. Now, being part of this gathering here today in London is an important phase of evidence collection that the Commission is doing. There are several commissioners here with me today, and um, they will be going to, going to join you, the experts, in some roundtable discussions to hear your views and ideas about how to achieve our goal. Now, we're in a period of evidence gathering over a couple of months, and once we've synthesized all of the evidence, the plan is then to publish a report, ensure that the recommendations are understood by national and local government policymakers, and importantly, then implemented. Now, we believe it's possible. It is possible to end new HI transmission in England by 2030. So we need to agree how to do it, we need to work out what needs, who needs to do what, and we need a shared commitment to make this happen. And then we need to jointly hold all the systems out there and all the people who are in positions of influence and power, we have to hold them to account to deliver. Now we know there's been fantastic progress in the UK. We know that the UK has been, and we heard from Bruce, a global leader in achieving the 1990-90 targets that were laid out by the UN. Last year, January last year, we had a commitment from the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, a commitment from the government that we are going to reach zero HIV transmissions in England by 2030. So that's what the Commission is aiming to do. Now, we know there are some challenges out there. There is no coordinated sort of whole systems approach or perhaps an agreed understanding of what's actually required to end the new HIV infections. We know that there are system problems that make swift progress difficult. We're also aware that public awareness of HIV as an issue is low. There are low levels of understanding of all of the remarkable scientific advances of recent years that we've just heard about. Awareness of PrEP and U equals U, they're low. People need to be made aware of it. We need to build the profile of HIV. We need to compete with all sorts of demands. Just think of all the issues that people are worried about at the moment in this country. Just think about that pile. But we need to put HIV up there and get, get the message out in a positive way, that U equals U. So 
the HIV Commission, we've been formed, we were formed, um, the announcement went out July last year. We met in August. We get terrific support from some dedicated resources that are basically funded through the Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust. And both of these organizations, they're using their convening power, their vast community of um, experts and uh, resources across the country to get them all together. So although the commission is independent from THT and NAT, we do rely a lot on them providing some centralized coordinating resource. So the commissioners themselves, we aren't necessarily the HIV experts. But boy, we've got an expert advisory group that is helping us through this journey. And that group is a fundamental part of shaping the work that we do. They're authoring papers, they're offering the expertise, they're advising on this whole evidence process. And we've got four streams of evidence that we're gathering. One was a written submission, and the submission um, deadline was the end of January, so we've got some written submissions from organizations and individuals that have already come in. And thank you to everyone who submitted evidence. We've now got the next two phases beginning. We've got Have Your Say, which is an, it's open now on the Commission website. Anyone can submit something in writing, or you can record videos, or send something in audio. And it's about your experience and what you think commissioners should know about ending H HIV transmissions. And then we've got oral evidence hearing sessions like today. We've had Birmingham, we've, got, um, we've, we've had Manchester, we're going to have Birmingham, Bristol, Brighton, and another one in London. And here is when we want to listen to you in a roundtable discussion format. And then the fourth and final evidence stream after that will be the expert advisory group who are providing 27 papers on five particular themes. So that's the whole evidence gathering. And today we've got two workshops and I know you've got competing priorities because there are all these other parallel workshops going on. But we've hold, we're holding a workshop at 11 and a workshop at 2.15. And we've got commissioners here wanting to listen to you directly. And the, I said the only way we can get this um, and, com and deliver on this ambitious goal is to hear everyone's views, get everyone's views around the table, because that's when the magic will appear and we can find solutions and end HIV transmission by 2030. So thank you very much for listening. And I think I'm handing, am I handing over to Valerie or back to Ian? Back to Ian. Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to pay tribute to uh, Inga and to the other commissioners who are all people who are very busy in their own professional lives but are so passionate about focusing on uh, achieving zero HIV transmissions uh, in this country. And uh, Inga, thank you for your commitment and your leadership uh, of the Commission. It is greatly appreciated. And so do please consider going to one of the Commission workshops uh, either this morning or this afternoon. Uh, one of the ways that we will achieve zero HIV transmissions uh, is by making sure that we've got high quality epidemiological uh, statistics and data. And I think in England we are extraordinarily well served by Public Health England and by some passionate epidemiologists. And one of those is Valerie Dalpesh, a great friend uh, to many of us. And so Valerie is now going to give us a tour de force uh, of the latest data around HIV. Valerie Dalpesh. Do I do anything? Just press. Thank you very much. Do I do something? Yeah. Oh, didn't no, you, you could do. Come back. <laughs> yes, Ruth and I are now. Doing a few um, so, firstly, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's always a super pleasure to come to this conference because I think you know, we can dance on stage. Uh, we've got the ukulele. You. Here we go. And what do I press? This one. Um, <clears throat> so I was asked to bring, bring out the data for today in some perspective. So caveats, you're all going to be disappointed because there's never the things that you particularly wanted to see. Um, there isn't enough intersectionality that I'll present, but it doesn't mean we don't have that data. 
It's really important to know that you can contact us. Um, for instance, I was talking to NAS colleagues in the past. We've, we've given data in great detail in um, specific populations for in, in specific communities when you're doing your work. So don't hesitate. Just because I don't present it here today doesn't mean we can't do bespoke analyses specifically when we look at, at populations. There's a lot of people to acknowledge in all of this work, particularly people living with HIV who allow their data to come to Public Health England for the processing. It's de-identified, as you know, but it is still a very important step. Um, in some countries, that data doesn't reach national services. Of course, I've got an amazing team at Public Health England, and, and without them, I wouldn't be here today presenting these data. And also, I'd like to um, thank some of the colleagues from many of the organisations that have helped also make these data a little bit more uh, personal. We worked on, on a number of projects, Changing Perceptions is one of those, where people who were participants of Positive Voices were able to look at the data at first and give their opinion, and that enriched the data in our presentation. And please go to the Changing Perception websites if you haven't. So um, the background to all this, and what I wanted here was like, you know, the Star Wars where the writing comes up, do, do, do. <laughs> um, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives worldwide to ensure we reach the 1990s, and there's been, uh, you know, a, a very, very international movement with the understanding that the 1990 <coughs> goals and beyond were also a way of reducing transmission as well as getting people well and, and, and um, on um, antiretroviral therapy. In England, we've reached those goals quite early on in, when uh, we look back, um, and we've reached that for all key groups. And we've also seen now a decline in gay bisexual men, which I use the term throughout, that stands for gay bisexual and other men who have sex with men. Rather than MSM, I'll be using that term. Um, and it's not that we haven't seen declines in other groups, but we know that gay men had the highest um, acquisition within the UK, and to see that dropping meant that something was really, really happening in this country. And of course, we've had, as we've uh, already discussed and uh, uh, described, the, the commitment by Health Minister, and we now have an independent commission, which I think has been a very good thing for Public Health England as, as others. It's putting ourselves um, to the scrutiny of the data that we have. What are we providing? Are we doing the right thing? Could we be doing differently? So it's actually a, a very useful exercise internally. Oh, there you go, there was a bit of that. So um, I probably won't cover it all today. Just to say all the data slides I'll be presenting are on our websites, so you don't have to worry about trying to jot down anything. What do we want to look towards? Uh, zero transmission. We've exceeded the UNA's goals already. We've seen declines in new diagnoses. We want, I'll be talking a little bit about the testing and the linkage to care issue. We've also have done extremely well getting towards zero deaths related to HIV. And in fact, we know that people living with HIV who are diagnosed promptly now have a, a normal life expectancy. So we, went, we compare the rates of deaths among people living with HIV with those with the general population. They are absolutely the same. People who present late, however, are still the group that we need to be very careful about. Another phenomenon is happening within deaths, and that's more for the general population generally. Could we be preventing further deaths? In other words, are there preventable deaths, not just HIV-related, that we could take the opportunity to, to reduce? And of course, this issue of stigma, which I'll come back to, we're now fortunate that we've had the stigma survey uh, a couple of times also in, in uh, adolescent as well as adults, and we also have some questions and positive voices, so we have some good data around um, stigma in this country, and we are continuing to collect good data, and the picture isn't rosy, and that's definitely an area, and pushing towards the knowledge of U equals U, for instance, is something that uh, is quite uh, paramount for people living with HIV, both within communities affected by HIV, but also outside. Zero transmission. So many of you know these data. We've now seen a decline on the left of new diagnoses. The, the level of AIDS and deaths has been very, very low for many, many years now. 
And in 2018, we've had a 28% drop in particular in the last three years, um, four years in that data. And that's what I want to concentrate. So altogether now we have about 3,000 women diagnosed, 3,000 men diagnosed in 2018 and about 1,100 women diagnosed. So most of the, the decline, but not only, um, has been in England. We've seen small declines in all parts of the UK. And if we look at that by our um, high-risk group that we could look in many different ways, we see that the drop was very significant among gay men since 2015, which is the red line. And that's a 39% drop. We know that drop was also continuing for uh, heterosexuals, and that has been a more complex picture because both men and women heterosexual acquired infections are also subject to migration patterns. So for some number of years, and I'm going to try and unpack that a little bit for you as well. How much of that is migration? How much of that is acquisition? What's uh, been also a success story for the UK is that we actually have very, very few transmissions within other populations that might be very key targeted populations um, for HIV prevention in other countries, particularly people who inject drugs and sex workers. We know that we have maintained those numbers very low. That doesn't mean we are complacent because there are obviously key outbreaks and we do note key outbreaks in, in people um, who inject drugs. And when they, they occur, they can be very, very significant. <clears throat> so where, if you're looking just, if we look now just gay and bisexual men specifically, we've seen that the decline has been particularly uh, prominent in London but not exclusively London. And we've seen it's been very prominent in gay men who are of white ethnicity born in the UK. And that is not the only group, however. People uh, come back to me and say, what is it in the other groups? It's not quite that 50% decline since 2015, but it is dwarfed by the high numbers of gay white men in the epidemic, as you can see from that line. However, we are seeing a small drop in other groups as well, and that's the type of information we are starting to unpack and look much closely, closely when we are looking at making sure no one is left behind. So certainly that's part of the discussion, who are the, the, the other men? The other thing to note is in 2018, um, the proportion of new diagnoses among men born abroad is, is now substantively higher than it's ever been. And so it's about half-half. And in fact, um, in some age groups, it's, there are more born abroad gay men being diagnosed than there are UK born. However, new diagnosis is a complex presentation because it's about people who get tested and reported. It's not about incidents by itself. So to understand incidents, in other words, the number of people who really did acquire HIV this year or last year, we need to estimate that using statistical inference. We're very fortunate that CD4 counts at the time of diagnosis can also be interpreted as when you were infected by using trajectories. And if you do that with our new diagnosis data for gay men and you retrace those CD4 counts by time of um, uh, probable acquisition, you get this graph. And this tells you when people probably acquired their infection using the new di diagnoses and CD4 data. And you can see here that essentially we've had quite a drop since 2012. So when new diagnoses dropped from 2015, three years before something was already happening. And that I think is quite key to understanding what's been working within the whole system. And if we look at more recently, 2015 onwards, this is quite a busy slide, but we can see that the red line are new diagnoses in gay men going down every quarter. And we also see the bars, which are actually the number of men who are being tested, and that has gone up and continues to go up. And the important thing about being tested, oh, sorry, they're attendees and they're being tested for HIV, is that many more men 
who were testing are testing more frequently, and that is another key. And again, you know all this because you've been doing a lot of testing in your uh, communities. It is working. The repeat testing has worked. And what's also been fundamental and only increasing in, in its intensity is the introduction of PrEP, and that's down the bottom here. Now, those numbers may not be totally accurate because we have not a very, very good idea ultimately of how many people do take PrEP in, in this country since you can acquire it from abroad, you can get it from internet. We do know about the impact trial and we do know from surveys, and I'll show you in a second actually surveys, um, that people are probably taking it because they may not be able to get it on, on the trial entirely and that's a whole question for the future. But it ha has put all that collectively, the testing and the PrEP, the condom use for those who are using condoms, maybe all, not all of the time, but it's still a very important part, and early treatment, and we've got a, an extraordinary world-first picture of an entire epidemic dropping before our very eyes. I actually think we are doing something incredibly right, and we've got to keep doing it and sustain those efforts. So um, it is a real, real acknowledgement to this sector and others for achieving that. We mustn't forget that. So you can see from the blue, the blue lines are actually the newly acquired infections within that. They're not just new diagnoses, There's, they're those, if you like, incident cases, and they're dropping very, very rapidly as well. So ultimately, what would be elimination? We'll never be able to get to elimination potentially as zero because obviously we have cases, we, you know, we have an open society, people come in and out, but we could have a, an achievable situation where rather than last year having 1,000 new incident cases, we could maybe drop down to 50 cases per year in gay men and not many more in others. That would be probably a, a definition of elimination in one in 10,000 that could be used. To get to that, it's still a step dropping down by 20 times what we're doing. However, it is achievable, and some of the modeling that's being done says we could actually achieve that not even by 2030, but perhaps earlier if we can continue doing what we're doing and intensify what we're doing, particularly with PrEP and other opportunities for everybody who needs PrEP to get onto PrEP. How am I doing with time? I'm doing great. That doesn't <laughs> Suddenly I'll know I'm out. Okay, some of the models that have been working, we all know, I always have to present Dean Street because I can't, I, I, it is so obvious from the data, when you look at national data, that Dean Street as a concept and over many years, the amount of testing and retesting of particularly high risk men and the introduction of PrEP and all, all of the other potential interventions that men have been exposed to <coughs> has had a profound impact on what we've been doing. It's not about replicating Dean Street absolutely everywhere, it's about the lessons learned from Dean Street and how do we accommodate that change to other places. So um, it comes right through and here on the left, not just about the testing and the new diagnosis, but also the time to treatment which I think now is within a few days, everybody's on treatment. That is phenomenal. It's not for everybody, but at a population level, just as Bruce said, the public health impact of getting everybody on treatment and U equals U uh, phenomenon has been profound. We know PrEP is absolutely paramount to the picture. There will be a PrEP, prep program very soon. I don't know how soon, um, this year. Um, more on that from, from many of us at PAG except me, potentially. Um, but what's important is, yes, it is high demand. We know that men and other populations at higher risk want PrEP, need PrEP, not every day, not for the rest of their lives, but it is a total game changer and there is no doubt that it has changed not only uh, the perception of how people uh, have sex, but also the whole stigma associated with having sex. Undiagnosed infections have dropped phenomenally as a result in the background, as you can see. So interestingly now, we're down to about three to three and a half thousand, maybe five thousand gay men who are not aware of their infection at this point. 
About a thousand of those probably will be were infected this year. There are another 5,000, so altogether 10,000 gay men who are virally not suppressed. So the other half of the equations are some of the men who, for whatever reason, were diagnosed but are still not on treatment or haven't been able to continue their treatment. So that's another challenge, retention, answering our phones. No, retention. <laughs> Just making sure we're paying attention. Retention in care and ensuring viral suppression of people diagnosed is becoming as critical in numbers as those undiagnosed. It's not all about gay men, clearly, and what we've seen is the huge decline in undiagnosed. So when we start looking at other groups, we're only looking at around a 500 to 1,000 potentially heterosexual men um, who are undiagnosed in this country. That's quite a challenge to actually reach those individuals, to get them tested. Do we implement the NICE guidelines? Will that get to all of those men? Do we need to think and look more closely who those undiagnosed individuals may be? How do we reach them further? I'll, that's why I'm here. I'm here to learn from you today from some of the workshops. When we look at heterosexual transmissions, we've said a lot of the decline has been from high prevalence countries. And we could say all along this has been all to do with acquisition abroad. And, and migration patterns. But actually, when you look at the UK born, well, yep, I'll look at this one first at the top. When you look at persons born abroad by heterosexual and whether or not they've acquired their infection in the UK, so this is an interesting slide. You can see in blue the acquisition, acquisition of people who've probably acquired the, their HIV after arriving in the UK, that doesn't mean they don't go back and forth perhaps, but they are now on our clock in terms of prevention needs, is actually about the same as the number who acquired it abroad. Okay, so, but we're also seeing a decline. So something is going right. We are actually decreasing both the number of acquisitions in heterosexuals acquired in the UK as well as those abroad. So there is something going right also for heterosexuals. One could say some of that is some of the heterosexual men are actually maybe other men who have sex with men. There's a little bit of that mixture in there that we need to unpack. But generally, prevention messages may be reaching our populations more broadly. But it's only a small change, and, and there's... They are low numbers, so we're going to have to do a lot to get to the very very, very end of those and reach, to reach that only 50 per 10,000 um, infection rate. Interestingly, for bisexual men and gay and bisexual men, equally for people born abroad, you're seeing that most of them are actually acquiring their HIV after arriving in the UK, but now that's plateaued to about 50-50 as well. So it's, it's a similar picture for both groups. And the challenge is now that we actually have as many new infections in heterosexuals as we have in gay men, just about. And they are very diverse populations within each of those. So that intersectionality, and I'm sorry, Sophie, I didn't get to read your intersectionality, <laughs> so I hope it's all there, is become essentially important. So what's worked? I've talked about it, the prevention, the condoms, the testing, the large increases through GUM clinic, but throughout the whole sector, the treatment is prevention, the U equals U, the PrEP is a game changer, the acceleration of, of test and treat, um, and access to PrEP in the one model, the strong advocacy of the, of the network here, uh, and I can't reinforce that more and more, the, the absolute crucial role of of the promotional work and the testing work by communities as well as reaching people who normally would not access uh, GUM clinics and signposting them to GUM clinics or e-services has been profound. And of course, many different types of testing modalities now are available. 
Over the decade, for instance, repeat testers among gay men has gone up, doubled. And they're crucial because they weren't just repeat testers, they were the men who were at the highest risk. Many of those on testing negative have opted for PrEP where they can as well. So we've got really a absolute success story happening and unfolding before us. I'm going to skip some of these um, slides, but just to show, for instance, optimal uptake, a, a, a huge credit to the GUM clinics as well for really reaching optimal uptake of uh, offer for, for gay men. This is not necessarily the case for heterosexuals, and that's a whole other challenge. Who needs to be tested in GUM clinics and outside? How do you know who's at higher risk, given the numbers and volumes are so much higher? And as you can see here for heterosexuals, we're testing over a million people a year through the GUM services. About 35,000 are black Africans, but you can see some of them are not getting tested, although they're eligible, so that's the red bar. Only about half are getting tested compared to who. And that's a really, really key. Who are these high-risk heterosexuals? Why are we not testing through GM? Or are they high-risk? What does it mean to be high-risk? How are we going to reach this new definition? Of course, there's been a huge amount of testing outside the GUM settings. And this is, um, in particular, community testing, which accounted for over 50,000 tests that we know about, and I'm sure there's more of those that we were able to collect. Um, so thank you for those who provide the data. We now also that there's been over 25,000 tests through the National HIV Self Sampling Service, and um, probably about 50,000 self-tests self that we're aware of. And that's probably the tip of the iceberg. There's probably more of those. So they're becoming a quite a substantive contribution to the picture. The challenge for us in surveillance is to make sure we know how many new positives are coming through these systems and registering that. So if you do have and you're part of a testing program, please make sure you're telling us about new diagnoses as well so that we can capture those. Otherwise, they get referred to the GUM, they only look like they're a GUM service. We have a, we have a field there, but we'd really like your input. Of course, what's been really, really critical is people are on treatment once they're diagnosed. Now, this is the rosier picture of, of what is imaginable, which is if we take a snapshot of our HARS data and we say what proportion are in care today, what proportion are on treatment. The only caveat to that, so it's 97%, which means only about 3,000 people are not on treatment. It could be actually as high as, as I said before, seven or 8,000 or even 9,000 higher because not everybody was in care that year, okay? So we, the people who are not retained in care are, are, are missing from these data. <coughs> so we've started to adjust that and we're saying that perhaps up to six or 7,000 gay men and maybe the same heterosexuals are not in care each year and not on treatment. That's a challenge for that in terms of retention. Importantly, and I think this is important for, for our US colleagues, we always show how there are very little in inequalities in access to treatment. Um, as you can see here, broken down by all sorts of geographies, the uptake of treatment is exceedingly high. And you can do that for who's on treatment, uh, linked to care, uh, retention rates, they're about the same. Zero deaths. Now, what to say about deaths? I've said already it's been uh, an, an important message that people in the UK who are on their treatments and have been for many years, and particularly those who were diagnosed promptly and now have good viral suppression, are also uh, have absolute normal lifespans, equal to that of the background population. We do still see some deaths, so it's 473 last year, and an audit that was performed in London um, with Sarah and Anne both here in the room to help with this uh, audit and lead on it, shows that there's still a lot of preventable deaths that we could be looking at. 
Some of them are AIDS related and that a lot of those are due to late presentation or people who don't return to care after diagnosis for some time. But there are also a range of preventable deaths which might be linked to mental health issues and other lifestyle factors that could be um, uh, reduced. And there's an opportunity in attending clinic and healthcare services for that to be reduced. What we do need is perhaps a definition of what that means and more audits and works to um, forward look, to reduce that. Only one minute to go. Okay, so in one minute. Um, uptake of treatment has, has increased in all groups, as you can see here, but it could be high in, in, slightly higher in people who inject drugs. Late diagnosis be, remains an issue, and you have all of that data. I just wanted to mention stigma because despite all, all of the efforts that we do, we still encounter stigma, and there's been a number of uh, ways we've, we've, as I've said, we've monitored this over the years. This is one story if, here from one individual. One in three people worry about being treated differently. 14% actually experience discrimination of some kind from their perspective. All of that needs to be unpacked. We need more training and understanding what that's about. The discrimination occurs across all modalities, um, all characteristics. And as a result, nearly one in five people actually avoid some kind of health care. People living with HIV, a lot of it might be dentists, GPs, other parts of the healthcare system, not necessarily their HIV clinic, but really, really important subject. And it can be seen, we can do these questions by different parts we've done here, by um, uh, cities across, uh, involved in the fast track cities. So leaving no one behind means really understanding and looking at the diversification of our, our um, epidemic. And you have these slides and we can look at those more closely at some point. It is a very diverse epidemic and we can look at it in many characteristics and across intersectionalities, not just as those. And so that's a, a call to you, both for heterosexuals and also for gay men. A lot of diversity in that. I'm going quite fast. We have challenges in monitoring, which I can go into. It's not perfect, but it is still really crucial data I've talked about the challenges for testing. Do we expand the NICE guidelines? How do we expand our community testing? Again, some, some questions for us during the day. And even within the U, even with those turning up to GUM clinics, for instance, many of them who have a, a, an STI in the previous year are not being recalled to come and get tested. And this is showing that slide, for instance. So there's work within the GUM clinics as well. And finally, getting to zero deaths mean essentially addressing a lot of our um, um, ways we do health screening within and, and um, promotion of retention care, but also addressing stigma. And certainly, I can't emphasize the U equals U campaign. How do we make that accessible locally and throughout and within the NHS and broader? So I think we are actually getting a long way. and We're nearly, nearly there, but it's going to be three times as hard just for that last little leg. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that tour de force, Valerie. And um, Valerie mentioned a number of times uh, PrEP, and I think that I'm conscious that colleagues from Public Health England have got to be um, slightly careful about what they say about PrEP. I don't have to be. I think it's still a scandal uh, that it's still not PrEP routinely commissioned on the NHS. And despite the constant commitments we're getting from central government, we're still seeing very little action. And it is a scandal. We now have some time uh, for questions. Uh, some of my colleagues are going to be coming around with microphones. Uh, and uh, if you can say uh, who you are, where you're from, uh, and your question, and I'll field it to members of the panel. I'm going to have a mic for them. Any questions from anybody? Yes. At the front on, the, on my left. Down here. Um, hi, my name's Nicola. I'm a health promotion specialist with Terence Higgins Trust in Oxford. 
Um, first of all, I just. Hello? Is it working? Okay, good. Yep. Put it near to your mouth. Yep. Uh, working. Hello? Is that working now? Do you want to stand up? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my name's Nicola. I'm a health promotion specialist with Terence Higgins Trust in Oxford. Um, thank you all very much for your presentations. They're really interesting and inspiring. Um, I have a question for Bruce. You mentioned in your presentation that addressing stigma for everyone, regardless of their viral load, is really important. And I'm just wondering how the U equals U message can be used to reduce stigma for people who do have a detectable viral load. Because just by the very nature of language, people might assume the opposite. So we're saying U equals U, no risk. So people outside of the HIV field might see that and then think, oh, detectable means risk. So how do we use that message to address that stigma? That's a very important question. We actually usually have a slide that call, is called viral load does not equal value, and it's a full slide to address this. There's two things. One is the public perception of people living with HIV. The public doesn't distinguish between undetectable and detectable. They just hear people with HIV and effective treatment can't pass it on. So in terms of public stigma, but in, is, does, isn't what we're seeing, it's not really happening, because they don't, but internally is the real problem of dividing, just like HIV negative and HIV positive, there's stigma between HIV positive, uh, undetectable, and detectable. It's really about being con conscious in our communications with people so that we acknowledge that when we're talking about it, whether it's on social media or in presentations like this or social marketing campaigns, and also to use this to lift people up. We had an hour and a half workshop in 2018 at the US Conference on AIDS just about this, bringing people together. A couple people stood up and said, I have a detectable viral load, but this gives me hope. It gives me hope that someday I can get to this, there are new treatments coming out, and I'm happy that other people um, are getting to this. Um, so we've, and we've been hearing that around the world, but we've also been hearing, usually from advocates who aren't HIV positive or who have undetectable viral loads that they're concerned about this. You know, we, we want to hear more from folks who have detectable viral loads about what other ways can we communicate this so that it's not creating that viral divide, which based on human nature is going to happen anyway. So we have to do whatever we can to prevent that and, and lift everyone up, especially with the public health argument um, to, to make sure people, we reduce those barriers to care. Did that make sense? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, back in the middle, stripey t-shirt. Is this one working? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Pete from Metro Charity. I've got a question I'd like to ask to Dame Inga, please. Um, the, many of us in this room will remember the legacy of the damaging um, campaigns for, uh, which caused a lot of stigma for HIV from so the 80s and 90s. So I think we're 90s. struggling to hear. Could you get it nearer to you? I think it's a bit slower. Yep. Still going? So many of us in this room will remember some of the damaging advertising campaigns that were on public television in the 80s and 90s. I'd like to ask Dame Inger if there's any plans for us to do national advertising about a lot of the things which we've spoken about already, um, which I think would make a massive difference to people's knowledge and understanding of uh, treatments like PrEP and TASP, and also p potentially bring people forward to test. So a lot of about national advertising like that, of course, is budget. <laughs> so we'll have to consider that. And I'm totally with you about some of the images that were out there that, you know, are perhaps remaining in some public's minds. And I think it's all got to be about positive. Everything we're doing on this has to get the positive message out. Now, we've got some pro bono support by a comms and media agency at the moment. If we're going to do something really national, that will need a lot of funding that could well be something that we need to do. I mean, we are doing our best on a very short um, budget at the moment about getting the message out there. I'm now, because we've launched this whole evidence thing and we, we're going to be doing much more media, mainstream media, and what I want to particularly do is to talk in a language that engages people who are really not very knowledgeable about the subject. So even you equals you for me that's a really tough thing. If, you, if, you're not, if you're not involved in this, how on earth does that resonate with you? We've got a lot of work to do to really simplify the language. And it's not because people are stupid at all. It's because when they're not close to it, they don't know the ins and outs and they don't understand. Yes, take at the front. Yeah, OK. It's probably the last question, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for these amazing presentations. Um, I've got one question, but with two angles. The first one is to do... Well, my name is Amdani Juma from the African Institute for Social Development in Nottingham. 
And uh, thank you for, to the Tenancy Against Trust and all the partners for uh, uh, this conference. Uh, the, the, the question is, uh, as we are getting less um, infection, so that means the NHS is spending less on treatment, so f hopefully there is more money that can be used back in the system to help us as a system to continue to work to do the brilliant work on prevention and testing and s stuff like that. So this is a question to the uh, Public Health England and the NHS generally. And on the other side, is I've, I've been to Africa, particularly in Uganda, uh, on two occasions. Um, and I've realized that um, the work we are doing together uh, in, the U in, in England generally and in the UK in, um, is, is a very good uh, coordination of work on both nationally, locally, and on our like uh, HPE. So, as part of the the ongoing trends to also reduce uh, possible uh, more HIV infection, in fact, people coming uh, in the country, how could we help? Uh, because you, you you could have seen the what Dr. Michael uh, impact in America and across the world on U equals U. So I was thinking together, how could we help uh, internationally, particularly those countries that we have links like Commonwealth and so on, okay. so that we can reduce those HIV, um, that people could get infected, who are failing on 90, 90, 90 in, in that way. Thank you very much. V Valerie, sorry, Inga. I, just, yeah. I just, want to, yeah. just want to say, I don't think we can answer that question on this panel. That is a massive question that we hope will come out during workshops and things throughout today. So thanks very much for the question. On funding and, and, and how we understand how much funding is out there altogether, we're actually wanting to build a picture because we know that the funding is quite fragmented in this country. And we know there's all sorts of private and voluntary groups that also do sort of private funding from other donors. So we've got to get our arms around this funding to make sure there's no wastage in the money that we're actually spending at the moment. Valerie, anything from your perspective on... Um, in terms of the less people and generics and cheaper, is that sort of your question in terms of... Yeah. yeah. I completely agree, and I think from today, all generic money saved should go into prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Denise Dixon, who's coming in your program, you would have Fred, um, but unfortunately Fred couldn't make it today. So Denise is going to be presenting. So yeah, that's not Fred, that's Denise, <laughs> just in case. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we're going to start with Dee, um, and Dee is going to um, tell us more about the work that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, I am here today to share some um, observation of uh, behavior and knowledge change over times that are uh, observed by GMI Partnership. Uh, I will actually start with telling you, explain to you who GMI Partnership is or who we are. Uh, here we are. I think you enjoyed this. So morning. over the last 10 years, the GMI Partnership has forged a model of HIV prevention that I believe has revolutionized the sexual health sector. With three diverse agencies coming together to deliver HIV prevention, in a way that hasn't been done before. It's really collaborative, brilliant agencies involved, and that no two days are the same. We're out and about all the time in different venues, talking to different kinds of guys, trying to, trying to answer their questions about sexual health, about PrEP, and HIV testing. One of the key benefits that we have as a partnership is drawing on each agency's expertise and really fostering a sense of GMI as an identity that's bigger than just three individual agencies that brings people together and maximizes the reach of the GMI partnership. We work in partnership with GMI because we want to give the possibility to the community of gay people, of gay men, to know about PrEP, to know about HIV testing, to help people to get HIV testing. The GMI Outreach team here is wonderful. They're very approachable, they're very friendly, and they're always ready to hear and help. And if you need someone to talk to, they're always there as well. And a lot of guys don't know how simple it is to get a HIV test and how quick it is. So if they're in a pub having a drink and they notice that we're doing testing, then it, it, you know, it, it's quick, it's easy, and they really appreciate the fact that we're there. The biggest success of the GMI partnership is the impact, the real impact it's had on people's lives throughout London. So, without further ado, we're going to get back into the presentation. Uh, oh, goodness. Sorry. It's lost. Uh, sorry about it. Don't worry. I'll get back to it. Yeah. All right. So, um, there's uh, lots of colorful numbers here. This is what we have been achieved during the years. Um, here, I will highlight the BASC. Uh, the reason I want to highlight the BASC is BASC is uh, representing behavior and attitude, skill and knowledge. This is um, historically GMI used to assess clients in the venue with a face-to-face -face, face -face assessment also online so we can assess more people, especially those people who don't um, use venues or we find them harder to encounter with. Um, hence, we have this you can see here uh, the mobile phone and, and then um, the sort of information sheets. That is what we promote online. Um, we mainly use Grindr to grind a shout out to promote these links and uh, these messages. Um, so uh, since July 2015, we've tried to use this to assess behavior risks, um, to promote up-to-date HIV prevention information, and to also um, observe attitude and collect source regarding prevention methods. Um, the whole 14Q is it basically is evolving because the promotion messages over time, over the years, is changing. For example, U equals U didn't exist. Well, it exists, but it wasn't that popular in 2015. So it was added on in 2017. And there were mo most of the information was slowly add on, and the old information maybe got retired, and so that's how the 14Q keep changing. So here, what we're presenting is the core questions that didn't, 
that didn't get changed over the four years' time, so we can actually compare this and analyze the change over time. Here is the main findings. Since July 2015, we have over 12,000 people reply to us online. And we are analyzing over 4,000 here because we only put out quarter four of each year's data to analyze. Um, and also, you can see there are four versions of this. And each quarter, there was slightly different thing because this is not a research piece of work. Um, people are constantly uh, engaged with us. And it's also, it depends on the grinder shout out frequencies and the timing. So you can see some of the quarter, the fourth quarter got a huge number of respondents. Some of them maybe slightly less. So anyhow, we put out the fourth quarter of each year to compare and to analyze the trend. Unfortunately, we encountered some technical issue with, um, with Grindr, so we don't have much data collected in 2019, so that's why I can only show you the data between 2015 and 2018. Uh, quickly, this is just the age dis uh, distribution and the ethnicity distribution. And the majority of the respondents are from London, uh, with a small uh, proportion from people outside London and from international travelers. So, key thing, this is what we found. Um, firstly, we've noticed the quarterly HIV testing behaviors be increasing over years, which is quite significant. And then, um, followed by, we also noticed people reporting, reporting condomless anal sex with casual partner has been increasing. Um, when we ask people whether they've heard of PEP, uh, there is a, a slight increase, but not that obvious, especially when you compare with knowledge about PrEP. So over the years, the knowledge around PrEP has been increasing dramatically, actually overcome the knowledge of PEP. And uh, the lower line, that is um, the using, uh, people self-reporting uh, to us using PrEP. So it's from 2% of 2015 to 32% by 2018. Um, Finally, that short one, that's the U equals U we just mentioned earlier, because we only had that question added on 2017. So you can see that knowledge has been increasing dramatically. And here you can see all the solid line is representing uh, all respondents. And um, the dashed line responding people actually uh, claim to be HIV negative by the time of responding to us. Um, we also ask people, those people who report to have um, condoms and no sex with casual partner, so what's the frequency? We do notice that there are more people reporting uh, all of the time over the years, or most of the time over the years. So it seems like um, condomless and no sex start to getting a sort of a rise over the years. And what dramatically decreasing is actually the risk and the worriness. Uh, the worriness about this risk. So you can see in 2015, people are still, a large majority of people are actually quite worried about having anal sex without condoms. And now it has been decreased dramatically. We also run some um, regression model um, to try to tell what are the difference between age group and ethnicity group. So firstly, is that probably a bit too small? Um, well, I'll just quickly go through it. Uh, so we ask people, um, different age group, obviously, and when compared with different age group, we notice that uh, age between 25 to 34 are the group that are more likely to report have um, frequent H um, HIV tests. And the line, oh, can't really see that. Sorry. Um, the age under 24 groups was, the red line, you probably can't really see. It was quite low at the bottom, now it's rising really quickly. So we are assuming that people with a younger age actually start to realize the quality, the, the, the quality <laughs> reports importance and start to adopt their behavior. And uh, talk about younger age, men under 24 have significantly lower level of knowledge about PEP and also about PrEP. Although the PrEP knowledge has been uh, rising, especially uh, by the end of 2018, it's still at the bottom of all age groups. Um, there's not much significant difference between um, uh, bareback sex. So when it comes to ethnicity group, um, we can see that um, 
it seems to be the Asian MSM reported less likely to have um, bareback sex with casual partner than white MSM. And however, when you come to the knowledge about uh, PEP and PrEP, uh, the Asian MSM seems to have a lower knowledge about it, uh, although it has been sort of uh, increasing a bit and then drops uh, still, is quite not really quite catching up with the other ethnicity group. Um, so, uh, about prep usage, we also ask, pe ask people like, um, "What's your prep usage uh, status?" So, when we compare that, we do notice that uh, people who reported they are having they're using prep are more likely to report uh, they are actually having a bareback sex with a casual partner. So we do recognize there's uh, lots of limitation of what we data and, and then what we collect here um, because this is not a robust sort of research work and we do notice that the respondents is not equally distributed over the time, over the years and also uh, we do know that the question of 14Q is quite limited. There's lots of, lots of information we can't really dig deeper. So Overall, basically, 14Q actually raised more questions than maybe we asked previously. Um, hence, the next step, we want to continue with 14Q. So um, we actually already add on um, questions for HIV-positive people about um, treatment and about healthcare engagement into the 14Q. And furthermore, we want to actually be able to add um, PrEP uses like dosage and health track frequency, that kind of question into 14Q. And we're also looking into partner up with search professionals and to heighten the study to an academic level. And um, we are also thinking about opportunity to have uh, more in-depth quantitative or qualitative research to actually be able to uh, enable us to answer more questions about uh, what spe specifically focus on the different age group and then ethnicity groups. So a special thank you to um, the, our commissioners and the Dewey London campaign. Without their support, 14Q is not going to be possible. And I also need to thank many of my GMI colleagues, and they helped to design and broadcast uh, the message to recruit participants, and also to the outreach team. They work strengthening our relationship with the community. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dee. Um, just so that you all know, uh, we'd agreed that maybe it would be easier if we asked questions at the end rather than after every session. Uh, so if you've got questions, please write them down if you've got questions for Dee, and then you can ask them later. Uh, now that I've got you captive, I can then introduce myself. Uh, my name, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to be your chair today, and my name is Taku. Uh, I'm from Terence Higgins Trust. Um, so. Um, for the next speaker, I'm going to be inviting George Halfin, uh, Terence Higgins Trust, uh, to talk about uh, a project for black, uh, accessing um, uh, self-testing online for black Africans. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Just get this working. OK, so I'm just going to uh, be talking today about a project we did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm just checking the clicker work, apparently doesn't start after this way. Um, so I'm just talking today about a project we did to help reduce barriers to HIV testing in black African communities. Um, um, as you know, a lot of people here know that uh, black Africans are dispropor disproportionately affected by HIV in England. Um, from the 2017 figures, we can see that 38% of all heterosexuals diagnosed with HIV, they were made up 38% all heterosexuals diagnosed with HIV in 2017, and they also face high levels of late diagnosis, with 57% of those diagnosed with HIV in 2017 diagnosed late, which indicates a need to, to increase testing uptake. Um, and we know that late diagnosis is even ha higher in black African um, heterosexual men at 69%, having the highest proportions of late diagnosis in any group looked at. Um, and um, we also know that HIV self-testing is a preferred way to test amongst um, black Africans thanks to Sigma's research in 2015. Um, and despite an increase of, of avail online availability of self-tests since 2015, there's been a lower uptake against, uh, amongst black Africans and any other group. Um, and um, when we conducted focus groups, 
we found that the key issues for that was privacy, fears about co privacy and confidentiality, um, especially for those living in shared accommodation. Um, so, um, Terence Higgins Trust, had conducted, after conducting um, two pilots in 2016 and 2015, um, Terence Higgins Trust uh, received an endowment to be able to uh, pay for 20,000 free HIV self-tests, um, and including 3,000 which were ring fenced for black Africans, and these were distributed between May and December 2018. Um, and with thanks to a grant from Public Health England, uh, we were able to pay for a, a click and collect service to test whether that removed barriers to testing, but also in, in uh, enhanced advertising to um, the black African communities because it, it does cost uh, more to um, reach black African communities because they're a less homogeneous group and because you don't, you know, you need to um, target them um, much uh, in lots of different places, so therefore the cost of advertising was between six and ten pounds compared to um, one pound for gay men, um, and that's why we, we needed the extra grant from Public Health England to make sure that those tests got to those people, but also to check that click and, if click and collect could remove barriers to testing. So um, we actually created a. I, I want to look at the screen, but I'm and look at you, but. If I look away, you can't hear me, so sorry if I just look like I'm looking at the computer. Um, so uh, we created a campaign um, in-house which was developed in consultation with black African people uh, via focus groups and online services to test mes messaging and creative that resonated with black African communities but also with MSN and other high-risk groups. Um, so we had to come up with a campaign that really relate was relatable to everybody. Um, and then we also sort of adapted it um, for, to targeted advertising, for targeted advertising to black African communities. And um, we did enhanced advertising for black Africans aged 18 plus and uh, for those aged 35 plus to target those most at risk of late diagnosis. Um, how the service worked is that um, people see an advert online, they order a test, um, and um, they can either receive the test via post, or if they ordered via click and collect, they can receive it via 4,000 click and collect outlets. Now, the click and collect outlets were in um, places like laundrettes or local news agents, and you could choose to pick it up from anywhere, near your house or far away from your house. So it was totally uh, anonymous. Um, and um, when you received your test, you had a special sleeve over it, which gave you information about the test and also if you uh, how to if you know um, answered questions about if you received a positive result, what to do, a card that you could take to your clinician for it to so you could do a follow up test, um, and you also received two text messages from THT to ask you for your result. Um, and if you reported a positive result, you were called within uh, 48 hours from THT Direct, which is our helpline, to support you. So it was a fully supported service. And, and in fact, um, we, we had um, 18,000, over 18, 18, 18,500 test kits were dispatched in this period. And actually, over a few months more, over 20,000 tests were um, were distributed and th over 3,000 were ordered by black Africans, um, 1,550 for men and 1,741 for women. 14% um, of black African orders were via click and collect and that compared to 10% overall because um, when we came to do the project, the actual cost was more in the advertising than the click and collect. Click and collect, and apart from setting up click and collect, the actual cost for click and collect is a um, subscription service. So that meant we, with the permission of Public Health England, we were able to open up click and collect to other communities as well. So that's why we could see you know, the uptake compared to uh, other communities as well, um, high risk communities. 50% um, of black Africans reported their results compared to 60% overall. And um, we had 11 um, reactive results, and one of those came via click and collect. Um, what's interesting, when you look deeper at the click and collect figures, 18% um, of black African men and 10% of black African women ordered via click and collect. And um, men, black African men aged 35 to 49 um, um, ordered by 19% of those at that age ordered via click and collect, followed by 18% aged 
50 to 64, and those are obviously the age groups with a higher risk of late diagnosis. Um, for on a relatively small sample of 54 orders, 17% of black African women aged 50 to 64 also use Click and Collect. Um, and so 18% of black African men and 10% of black African widow order women ordered via Click and Collect. Um, what's interesting here is uh, if you look, um, as I said, we were able to widen it out to wider communities. We also, as a byproduct, noticed that the uptake of um, Click and Collect in MSM, in, in BME, BME, MSM communities was actually higher. Um, so there was, um, for Pakistani MSM, 29% um, ordered um, via Click and Collect and 24% um, from Indian backgrounds and 19% from Chinese backgrounds. So actually we can see in ethnic m minorities, it really it helped to reduce barriers for testing across the board. Um, we did a follow-up uh, survey to people who had ordered test. We got 78 responses from black Africans and um, 10 of those had used click and collect. Um, so from the 10, half of those said the primary reason they used, the reason they used uh, click and collect was not wanting anyone they lived in to accidentally open the package or find out they were taking an HRV test. And half of click and collect users said they did, it was due to confidentiality. Um, and what was interesting um, was that for non-click and collect users, a higher proportion of black Africans reported that they would have chosen it if they'd known about it. I mean, it was quite clear on all the steps, but you know, it's obviously if people are doing it in a hurry, they might miss it. But they did say if they'd known about it, they would have done it that way. So what we can conclude from this is that um, we really believe it addressed privacy issues and confidential issues about against, uh, for black African communities. Um, and, it, uh, and especially in, in black African men uh, who are aged 35 to 64, uh, the, the uptake was higher. Um, and we believe that click and collect can lower barriers to testing for this key group uh, affected by late diagnosis, as, as well as potentially access for, for other minor ethnic minority groups where confidentiality and you know, living in shared accommodation can be an issue and people do not want other people to know they're taking an HIV test. Um, and the higher, we, th we believe that the higher cost of acquisition for um, black Africans is a good indicator there is a need to invest more because we found that when we did spend more on advertising, we got more uptake and, you know, and, and then we got results. And I think it backs up with what Valerie was saying earlier about, you know, as, you know, the, the we've got to find less, we've got to find, um, there's going to be more and more needles in high haystacks to find, and so it's worth investing the money to find those needles in haystacks as the rates of diagnosis goes down. Um, and uh, we believe that click and collect should be considered in other postal uh, testing in, uh, uh, interventions where sensitivity around privacy may be an issue, um, and that applies within HIV, but also other you know health uh, areas where you know they might have other sensitivities as well. Um, and we believe that more research needs to be done into self-reporting because, as I said before, you know, overall we got 60% self-reporting, but with black Africans we got 50%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Um, so, like now we've heard from uh, from D talking about us following what people do, uh, like understanding the, uh, the changing patterns in people's behaviours. Um, at the same time, um, I think there is also the, the, the question about the online. Um, the, uh, the, uh, there we go. Um, the issue of, uh, of online uh, provision of tests as well for us to be considering issues. Um, now. <laughs> You'll have to set that up for me. Okay. Perfect. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> Technophobic. So, which, which button do I press? So, we're going to be pressing this one. Okay. To go forward. Yeah. So, right. if, if anything goes wrong, I'm right there. I'll blame you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Anne. Anne uh, has got this fantastic project, um, which is quite innovative. And I'm um, looking forward to hear about it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I've just looked at my watch and my pulse is 128. Um, so I hope I don't have a heart attack while I'm stood here. Is he a doctor in the house, just in case? Right. 
<laughs> on we go. So I'm Anglu, I'm the HIV Prevention Coordinator with a really small organisation up in Yorkshire called the Brunswick Centre. I've forgotten which button I press already. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Hey, there we go. So we work across two local authority areas, which is Kirklees and Calderdale. And um, we've got a HIV service which um, provides support and prevention. I'm the prevention side. Um, we've got an LGBT youth service, a counselling service, training service, hit incident reporting centre and a stop smoking support uh, we give to people as well. We've only got, I think there's about eight, eight full-time staff. So why food banks? Um, you know, we test across places where many of you do already and we were trying to think a little bit outside the box and how we're going to reach other people that you know may be at risk we thought well right we'll have a go at food banks and initially the idea was to try and reach uh, new arrivals from sub-saharan african countries because we don't have um we don't have large communities of people from africa and we thought maybe they'll be using food banks when they're new to this country so we thought we'd have a go there instead what we did find we didn't find any people from africa but what we did find were people iv drug users sex workers homeless people living on the streets people with mental health issues and other people that were just struggling in life um, to be honest with you and initially there was a reluctance because the first food bank that we went into in calderdale is a church-based project so they were quite mm, reluctant to let us in anyway <laughs> I talked them round, <laughs> and when I said, <laughs> when I told them that we would, they were saying, and I can understand that, you know, people that's got major issues in their life, um, being tested for HIV is just not on their agenda. It doesn't even come into the thoughts. Um, it's just not something that is is up there. So when I said that we would be giving five pounds to try and encourage people to test, then the full bank said, oh, actually that might work. So yes, you can come in. I've lost my thread now. Where am I? right so why do we use incentives well you know we use them because it's encouraging people um who may be at risk to test or otherwise they wouldn't test i'm just losing my notes now um, and it can help break down barriers uh, to testing because when we've used it in other areas people have said well they've not tested because they've been scared of that initial test or they've been scared of the results or or whatever but that incentive just gave them that kick that they needed to sort to sort of come on the first visit that we made to the, this particular food bank the first one that we went into we did 31 tests um and every person without exception of those 31 people that tested said that they wouldn't have tested without that five pound incentive and this food bank gets oh they must get 150 people a week through the doors and obviously there were only me and my own and i were only there for um three hours so i couldn't really do any more so i decided they said they'd let me go back so i went back a few weeks later and i tested 30 more people and within that 30 on the second session um, i got a, one reactive and the reactive was a young woman in her 20s not from one of the high risk groups she actually she weren't a drug user she weren't a sex worker just a young woman down on her look and she tested reactive um, after the confirmatory tests um, she was hiv positive now that particular young woman she comes to our support service now and she said to me, well, do you know what, Anne? I would not have tested without that five pound. She said, I were down on my luck, had no money, I were absolutely desperate, thought I'll have a test, I get a fiver. So that's why we do it. That young woman is an example of why we do incentive tests. And we do get support from our commissioners as well to do it, which is really good. I do have to give there's two sides to the coin and a lot of people are against incentive testing and i understand that and there are ethical considerations and concerns to take into consideration it can be seen as coercive uh, putting undue influence on participants on the decision whether to test or not and when you've got financially disadvantaged groups they're, they're more vulnerable because they need the money um, and it can raise questions around its cons consent is it truly given if payments involved but i have got to say that um, it works for us 
It worked for that young woman who got a positive result because she would have been a late diagnosis and she possibly could have died. And it works for other people that we test there that get access to services now that they wouldn't, they wouldn't go to, they wouldn't access mainstream, mainstream services. It, it, it gives them the options to... Be, I'll go into that. I've lost the thread now. <laughs> I'll go into that later on, actually. Um, I fully explain the process to people beforehand um, so they know exactly. Because, you know, people will just sit down, they'll give you the finger. They just want the fiver. Do the test, give me the fiver and let me go. So do do brief interventions uh, before they get the fiver. <laughs> so, you know, that's good. Right. So impacts of this, what we do is we've expanded um, because it's been successful there. We've expanded it now to uh, other food banks across the local authorities that we work in. And I've been able to bring in other agencies with me now. So we've got a more holistic approach. So I get, I get a sexual health nurse comes in with me now so I can offer sexual health screenings. I get a drug and alcohol support worker that comes in as well at the sessions. So people, you know, can, can access other services. And we are reaching out to people who normally wouldn't access these services. And since we started doing this in, I think it was November 2018, that very first one that I went into, we've tested 218 people in just two food banks. Um, so they all now know the status. And I just put that there, together makes a difference because working together with other agencies, it does make a massive difference to people's lives. Initially, it would, they were just getting tested for HIV. Now they can have sexual health screenings, they can have drug and alcohol advice and support. There we go. I'm being quick. How much longer have I got? Five minutes. I've nearly done. <laughs> I have to slow down when I'm nervous. <laughs> right, so these are just some pictures of um, places that we go to. That's 42 Market Street, and that's a social service. They approached me, actually, after they heard about the work in Ebenezer. Um, and that's a social services run um, agency. Um, and they get people, they give advice, housing advice, and they support people. And they said, oh, will you come in here and do your testing? So I, I go in there twice, and about every six months. The, uh, the other one opposite that one, that's the Ebenezer. That's the first with all the people queuing outside. And that's the first one that I went into. And then uh, Huddersfield Mission, um, I go in there, and that's the building on the outside. And then this is a new one um, that I'm going into next week, actually, at Backley. You've all recently seen the MP, Tracy Brabin, with the dress hanging off her shoulder. Um, she's the MP for that, for that area. So I'm going in there next, uh, next week. <laughs> Give her a bit of publicity. There you go. Uh, and that's it, really. There we go. Uh <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne. Um, I, I have to say, I think uh, your presentation as well at Beaver last time really got people uh, oh, thinking of... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I think there's a lot uh, to think about, which, uh, which, which, which has been spoken about. I hope you're taking notes uh, and we'll have time for questions afterwards. Um, so, uh, lastly but not least, as the standard saying goes, um, well, well, we're not having Fred, we're going to... Uh, actually, uh, yeah, you... you, you, you Introduce myself. Okay, yeah, thank, you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Taku. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Denise Dixon, and as Taku said, I'm not Fred Semenguera. Um, unfortunately, he can't be here today, but I'll stand in his place. So I'm just going to get the presentation up. Okay, so yeah, morning, everyone. So um, I'm going to talk about a reflection on HIV testing in the London Borough of Croydon during National HIV Testing Week because we've had to change our approach over the last seven years due to budget constraints. So Croydon is an ethnically diverse southwest London borough, and despite recent decline, we still have a high late diagnosis figure of 47.1%. And anecdotally, we know that, that a lot of that is because of missed opportunities in healthcare settings, as well as, as we've all heard today, the ongoing HIV-related stigma. So this has been, the reduction of late HIV diagnosis has been a key priority for the Sexual Health and HIV Partnership Board in Croydon for many, many years now. So since 2013, Croydon has been commissioning a local targeted HIV testing week campaign 
during National HIV Testing Week, but we've also had an additional week to coincide with World AIDS Day. So, as we all know, National HIV Testing Week is a campaign to really promote regular testing to those that most affected population groups. And in Croydon, our local campaign aims is really about increasing public awareness of HIV, but also the acceptability of HIV testing, reducing stigma to everyone that we speak to on the streets, but also encouraging people, particularly those from a black, African, and MSM population groups, to get tested and test regularly. So let's talk about the approach that we started off with. So in 2013 to 2015, we had a mobile testing unit. So this was a huge bus which had two consultation rooms where people could have a point of care test. And this bus would travel throughout the borough and in pre-advertised places, we would be able to then do testing. So there were a number of benefits from doing HIV testing on this bus. We were able to, we were mobile, so we were able to go throughout the borough. It also was very popular, so the bus became synonymous with the campaign. It was, people would ask, okay, is the bus going to be there for National HIV Testing Week? And also, when we would go to an area and it wasn't that busy, we would be able to relocate very quickly to another area that would be a bit more busier. However, there were quite a lot of drawbacks from using this bus. So having the bus on its own was quite an expensive thing to kind of engage in. It was also the cost of branding the bus because we branded it with our local campaign so people would know that this was National HIV Testing Week and when they saw other posters, other places, they'd know that this is where they could get tested. Also, we needed it, the cost to park and store the bus securely overnight was quite expensive. And also, still, because of stigma, some community members actually didn't want to be seen to be getting on a HIV testing bus. So, despite all of that, annually we had between three to 400 tests every, done every year between 2015 and 2000, 2013 to 2015. But then in 2016, it was realized that actually this was not a sustainable method of delivery. We weren't able to keep up with that budget. So, we had 50% of the budget, and our goal was really to capitalize on all of the benefits that were offered by the bus, but without actually using the bus. So, what we did is we had multiple sites throughout the borough, and it would, we'd capitalize on using commercial and community venues such as hairdressers, we would use supermarkets, um, pharmacies, anywhere that people would naturally go, we would look to how we can use those. We also needed it to be accessible to the BAME community as well as the MSM community. So we would set up in venues which were in high local populations of the BA, Black African or BAME individuals. We also wanted to ensure that whatever venues we used, it had a high natural footfall of people coming through so that in their natural everyday business, we could stop them and offer them a HIV test. The last thing is that we really wanted to raise awareness of the opportunity to test. Because of the great branding of the bus and people really associating HIV testing with the bus, we needed to really publicize that this opportunity was available within venues. So we trained and utilized work, um, outreach workers as well as volunteers to be able to talk to the community and we trained over 150 volunteers annually to talk to the community and to engage them in testing for HIV. So some of the benefits that we found was that the majority of venues were provided free of charge. So that helped with the budget. Also, we had multiple venues every single day. So between 11 and seven, Monday to Saturday, we had four venues operating. And on Sundays, we had two venues. We were also able to, when we went to a venue, if it wasn't very busy, we'd be able to reallocate our volunteers as well as the testers to go to another venue, which was more busy and to get more and more people in. We were supported by multiple stakeholders, so it was a really partnership approach. So THT designed all our local posters. They were very influential in the work that we were doing. We had Croydon College, which is the local college. A lot of our volunteers came from there. They did a two-day training on how to talk to the community, how to reduce stigma. So if one of the community members had um, mentioned some very challenging things, how to actually correct them with facts. We also um, worked a lot with our pharmacies as well as our local NHS Trust and Qua Africa and Metro. We, as I've mentioned, the volunteers, and we also had annual councillor involvement. So as you can see, this is a couple of pictures of, so this picture just shows the volunteers um, at an awards evening afterwards, so they get a certificate to be in a sexual health champion after they've done all of their training. Part of our campaign was um, doing an intense media mail out, so to over 210 venues, so whether that be supermarkets, whether that be community centers, anywhere that 
someone would congregate, we would send, it would be local churches, mosques, we would send HIV information, so the posters, as well as any information to dispel myths. We also had posters in various formats, so in the shopping centre we'd have posters, on phone boxes, on buses, on trams, everywhere just to publicise. And we ensured that all of our volunteers and workers wore the THT available t-shirts. So let's look at the budget and the outcomes. So the total budget for annually for the project since 2016 was 25,000. And I've got to say that we've never actually reached 25,000. It's always been about 22,000. And that's the cover of commissioning of a testing service, the venue hires for some of the venues, all of the staff costs for testers, advertising, as well as printing costs. And so our results from 2013 to 2019, as you can see from 2013 to 2015, we had around 300, 300 to 400 people. And then we changed our tack. We had 50% of the budget. And in 2016, we had double the number of people that were tested. That continued to increase until 2018, where we had 1,144 people tested over a two week period. And we don't believe that we've peaked. So last year we had 961 people tested, but a lot of those people that had tested had said, when we saw them on the street, they'd say, you know, would you like a test? They said they'd either tested recently, they've been testing since they tested last year, they now test more regularly. We could see from this year that a lot of people are now regularly testing. One thing that we attribute the success of the numbers increasing is really about having those outreach volunteers, having those people there outside the venue, actually reminding people, okay, it's really great to have that pin of this is National HIV Testing Week, but really reminding people, okay, you can go and get tested. And even if they don't want to get tested, this is where you can get your local test, signposting them to the most appropriate organization. Also using community venues. So it reduced the stigma of people saying they don't want to go onto a bus. They don't want to be seen to be going onto a bus where it's HIV testing. We also had varied testing times, so it was, people were able to access testing during different times. And we had a dedicated project group actually working on it, as we all know, nothing Nothing can be done unless there's people really looking at an area and really dedicated to working on that area. And then these are just some results from last year's testing. So as you can see, 50% of those that tested were identified as black or black British. Then we had a relatively equal number of people identifying as female and male. And then in terms of sexual orientation, we had 82% of people identifying as heterosexuals. We did have just over 12% either not stating or preferring not to say. So kind of just taking a take home message from this is that we were faced with a huge challenge in 2016 and we, we were so used to using the bus and the benefits that the bus offered, but because of the financial constraints, we had to think of a different way of working. And it really worked in terms of using multiple venues at multiple different times. So in terms of the number of reactives we've had, we've had between zero and six reactives annually. So altogether, it's around 20 reactives. Some of those people are retesting their status, and some of them were true reactives. So the lesson learned for us for future campaigns is really about planning earlier in the year. So we usually start our planning in September. Re a lot of the things that we do can be done much earlier. It can start from now, re such as commissioning the organization to do the testing, informing other organizations that we are going to, that HIV testing week will happen, or also dispelling some of the myths throughout the year. It's also working closer with organizations supporting vulnerable groups. So just like Anne had said in terms of with the, working with the food banks, it's things like the homeless shelters, looking at how we can really access those communities which are more vulnerable. And then it's also about widening out the testing. So right now we're just testing for HIV but how can we make it a more holistic approach? How can we test for other STIs? And how can we ensure that we've got that captive audience in front of us if they need to be signposted to a mental health organization or another organization? How do we ensure that we're doing that? And the last thing is really about ensuring that we have a dedicated staff capacity to continue to put in the work to lead this campaign. Thank you, that's everything. <laughs> Um, I would like to say a massive thank you uh, to uh, our presenters. Now, before you run away, 
is your chance for us to actually uh, talk about a few things. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to sort of uh, bring up uh, sort of uh, some of the uh, issues which has been uh, which have been uh, covered uh, uh, by, by everyone. Um, uh, D, thank you so much. I think uh, it was super important for us to just have that picture of what is happening, observing what is actually happening. Because sometimes we can be caught up in numbers and not actually understanding the behaviors, like what, 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 what it means. And I think like your, your, your surveys, like are they, they capture something which is quite different from just saying how many people have got HIV, how many people haven't. It's about what are people doing over time. And I, I, I hope that that came across for everyone and is useful. Um, George, as well, thank you about the idea of how do you make uh, testing accessible to other communities as well. And I think there's lots of learnings there which came up about, even though that was for Black African, it had indications for other communities as well. Um, and thanks for challenging us about incentivized uh, <laughs> testing um, and I think like what you spoke to which is the same thing that Denise was speaking about is the issue of how do we make sure that we work better in partnerships uh, because it seems there is a common thread which is coming from there uh, to talk um, about uh, partnerships. Um, I think investment came up uh, in a number of, 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 of the areas. Uh, investment for you saying the money went down but you had to find a way to, to, to do it. Uh, George was saying in some of the areas you need more money anyway to, to do that. So I think there's quite interesting conversations for us to have there. So uh, at this point, we're going to open the conversation to the floor. There are mics in, in, in the crowd. So maybe to make it easier, if you've got a question, if you lift it up and then, yeah, we'll do it that way. She went first. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, thank you for your talks. Um, my name's Catherine, I'm a health promotion specialist from Terence Higgins Trust in Oxford. So we do quite a lot of outreach and testing um, in different communities. My question is for Anne. I know incentivized testing can be quite controversial, as you mentioned. Is there a limit to how often people can come back and test? So if they're visiting a food bank every week, they presumably can't get HIV tests for a five or every week? Yeah, good question. Um, it started off when, when we started the incentive testing, because we do it at different venues as well, not just at food banks. Um, you know, people were taking advantage and I obviously can't remember everybody that I've tested. Um, so now we say um, 12 monthly tests or if somebody thinks that they've been at risk or if it's the first time test with us. So we, we limit it that way. Otherwise you can just go on forever. Okay, uh, just, just, just behind you, just behind you. Masfin? Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Masfin. I work for Embrace Paper Support Center. We are based in Haringe. We do HIV testing and STI testing actually in our locally. We are part of the uh, public health, uh, I mean HIV prevention in Glide. Uh, it's a very good uh, presentation, especially when we do our outreach. We gain knowledge of the HIV. Thank you, but my question goes to uh, Georgina, which is click and uh, uh, test issue, is how you capture actually uh, data, especially my concern is for people who arrived in this country recently uh, about their immigration status or uh, their uh, level of education probably in understanding the English. So how do we really uh, understand that or has the data really uh, help us actually to uh, do with those people? Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, well, sorry. we <laughs> wanted to make it as accessible as possible and we didn't want a very long form for people that would be a barrier for people. So when they went online, it, it really asked, answered only essential questions about ethnicity, um, where they were from, and then their information so that we could send them the test um, and their sexuality. Um, and I think it was like five or six questions and actually we, we um, refined this further for outreach testing because even the simple questions that we had online were too much in outreach settings. So in outreach settings, they, they did it in even less questions. So we didn't want language or anything to be a barrier. We just wanted to make sure that they were from a most at-risk community to qualify for the tests. 
um, and that was our key key thing. So we only captured basic age group, ethnicity, ex and, and sexuality. We didn't go into more detail on than that. Yeah, somebody right in the back. Thank you. Thanks very much, John Gilmore um, from University College Dublin. Just firstly to compliment everyone on the work they're doing in, in really difficult times in the UK with, with um, funding hunts to public health consistently um, coming every year. Just when you think it's kind of levelling off and other cut comes and I know how difficult it can be. I've just moved back to Ireland. I've been in the UK for a few years. Um, my question is, is again to Anne around the incentivised um, uh, HIV testing and food, but I, I have to, I, I'll put my hand up, I have real, real concerns around, around this. And then when kind of comments were made around people taking advantage, um, people who are poor um, and need to use food bank taking advantage by accessing a test, I think is difficult. And what we know is that people who are in poverty neglect all, all, all areas of their health care because their priorities is feeding themselves. But I'm just wondering about the ethical oversight, because I know if I try to do this in a clinical setting, or try to do it in a, in a research setting in the university with a vulnerable group incentivizing monetarily for you know, impoverished groups, it would be an absolute ethical no-no. Incentivized, incentivized research is used, but more in general groups. So I'm just wondering what ethical oversight the Brunswick Centre goes through. Do, do it go through ethics committees in the council, or, or, or in what way are you, are, is that looked at? I didn't quite catch that last bit. Can you just say it again? I'm a bit deaf, love. <laughs> Just wondering what ethical oversight, like who's reviewed this process in terms of the idea to, to rolling it out? Um, because as I said, if it was done in a university or in a clinical setting, um, there would be an ethical committee looking at it who probably wouldn't allow it to happen. Right. Uh, nobody really, to be honest. Um, we commissioned through um, the council public health in both the authorities and our commissioners are, are quite happy for us to, to do that, to be honest. Um, and I think that's because um, they're quite happy with the work that we do overall. So they give us the funding and they're quite happy we can choose to do whatever we wish um, as long as we're meeting their criteria. So we, we don't have that issue at all. We don't have any problems or any comebacks from anybody, to be honest. Uh, I guess probably from what's coming up is just the questions about how do we make sure that it's, it's done in an ethical way. Um, so I think probably that's a question that we can continue uh, talking about. Um, uh, sorry. Hello, good, uh, good, uh, good afternoon everyone, my name is, uh, still morning maybe, my name is Robbie Curry, I'm a Sexual Reproductive Health Commissioner in Bexley. Thank you very much for all your presentations, very informative. One of the things I wanted to ask, particularly with this area, as a Commissioner, um, there is always a bit of the focus on the number of reactive tests. And obviously with the programmes that you're doing, you're obviously addressing stigma and encouraging more people to potentially test or come forward. So um, I suppose my question more for Croydon colleagues, um, I'm sorry, um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure of your name, my Denise. apologies for that. De Denise, Denise, my co uh, question is for you, Denise, is how have you been able to triangulate any of the activities that you're doing? You mentioned in your presentation that the numbers have tailed off slightly because some people are saying they've tested more frequently. Do you have any other further impact of this particular program? I think, what, about 150 grand over six years or so, that it's actually had greater increases in the number of people coming forward for testing, either online or other programs or through GU services, that you're able then to use to say that actually this program has addressed some of those issues too. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Rob. Um, that is a good question. And that's from our evaluation last year when we were looking at the numbers and looking at the fact that they've decreased slightly from 2018. It was looking at how and one of the things, because we were hearing from volunteers and outreach workers that a lot of people had said that they'd already tested, we are now looking at how we can work with Croydon Health Service on how we can identify that those people have tested. And it's not just an excuse that they're saying, I've already tested, I now test regularly. So that's something that we're now looking into to gather that data so that when it's the next campaign, we can marry up that data a little bit more. Understanding that also where have you tested or to challenge them a little bit more on that, to just ensure that it's not just what they're saying, but that it's actual fact. But at the moment, I haven't got, we haven't got that data to say that 
although this campaign has been taking place for the last six years or seven years, this is the impact that it's having wider. And also in terms of just catching on your point with reactives, so although looking at the number of reactives is not a main campaign aim for us, it's a great benefit if we do have a reactive result. It is really more about that raising awareness of HIV as well as reducing stigma and increasing the acceptability of HIV testing. How we measured the increase of testing? No, the, the other, the non-test outcomes. You were saying about that it's an increased potential for reducing stigma. How have you measured any? any so it's by the questions that we ask. So all of the outreach workers will have um, a questionnaire, for example, to go through with the public. So it's certain questions. It could be certain myth questions to dispel myths. And we've seen that over time. So we've been evaluating. 2016, we started to do real evaluation and we've been able to see that less of the questions that they're asking, people are having better increased knowledge, but it's something that we want to look into further in terms of how we can, the wider, more of a holistic approach to when we have the outreach volunteer, how are they not only just dispelling those myths on HIV, but wider sexual health. Okay, uh, we've got limited time, so um, quick questions, we'll take maybe uh, two questions. Um, Roger, just Yep. Uh, any other question which is pending as well? Any other pe with, a, with another question? Yeah. After Roger, anyone else? Okay. So we we'll have two questions from there. Roger, yours first, and then yeah. Thanks, uh, Roger Beverly from Nam. It feels to me that self-testing is always being promoted as something where the model is to distribute it by post, and that definitely works. And there's, there's not. I'm not trying to diss that at all. I'm just thinking about, are there other ways that we could get self-tests to people? And is anyone thinking about distributing self-tests in an outreach environment? And that's really a question for anyone in the room. Not yeah, just I, I can quickly answer that. So as part of the THT program, actually, we did try out uh, distribution of, 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 um, of self-testing in, in, um, sort of in, in, in person. Um, one of the things which is there to think about, some people, they say they want the test, they take it, and then you find it in the bin afterwards because when you're out, it's, it's a hassle to be then carrying it around. So what we were also working is assisted ordering. So it is still ordering online. Um, you are in an outreach setting where you're encouraging people to ad actually order the test, um, but you help them order the test immediately. So it, it has been tried. We are still sort of working on expanding that. Uh, but just one thing that we did notice is that for some people, the test is still a bit too big to be carrying around on a night out. Just, yeah, but it's on the, yeah. Hello, thank you. My name's uh, Tom Manevry. I'm from Vive Healthcare, one of the sponsors. A question for you, Denise, on the Croydon testing. Are you able to comment on the relative success of the different venues, the pharmacy, hairdressers, leisure centers, I think you said? Yeah. So, um, so far, the pharmacies have been the most successful venue that we've been to. And that was pharmacies in areas where there was a very high footfall as a whole pharmacies. Also, hairdressers have been, we've looked at the venues and we've also looked at the weather on the day. So, because National HIV Testing Week is in November and it's often very cold, if someone, one of the hairdressers is right outside a bus stop, so people have to wait, it's actually easier to have, come in, have a HIV test in a discreet area, out of the cold, whilst you're waiting for your bus, because you know your bus is gonna take a little while to come. So, we've known that hairdressers and pharmacies are the most effective venues so far in Croydon, and also in certain areas, they are the most effective. So we've had pharmacies in other areas, such as South Norwood, which haven't been as effective. Um, unfortunately, our time has come to an end, and I have to say, um, please, let's give a massive thank you. Thank you. Um, so, quick housekeeping. I know you are hungry, so this is what we're going to do. So, where we had our registration, if you head down there for re uh, where, where we had our registration, that's where you find food. Um, if it's if it's too packed, 
there, there is another place which is downstairs, but at the moment we're trying to get the people who are downstairs to go into uh, like um, the, the, the lower ground floor. So if you could go to the, where we, we did the reception, uh, the, the um, registration. Thank you.